So cancer screening in general is controversial in older adults simply because the evidence on the one hand is inconclusive, primarily because the clinical trials that have established the value of screening do not include these older adults over age 75. At the same time, many older adults have been screened when they were younger. They want to continue being screened, so it's a clinically important issue for which we don't have great evidence, and as society is aging, we're struggling with figuring out whether continuing screening is appropriate or might it be inappropriate. Sure, so let's start with the pro-screening side. The pro-screening side is stating that we should continue screening in individuals beyond a certain age, let's say age 75, in the setting of breast and colorectal cancer, even though the guidelines are either silent or discourage screening beyond that age, um, simply because we have no magical transition between age 75 and 76. The human being, whether a woman screening for breast cancer or a man or woman for colorectal cancer, haven't really changed fundamentally, biologically, so that the evidence that would apply in a 74-year-old should be extrapolable to a 76-year-old unless clinical circumstances have changed. We know that the evidence in 74-year-olds is that if we screen for breast or colorectal cancer, we can pick up cancers earlier that can be treated and more likely to be cured rather than waiting until people have clinical cancer that is detected after people have symptoms and trying to treat at that stage. So we can detect tumors earlier, we can extend life and disease-free life with screening in these settings. So once someone has suddenly reached the age of 76, the argument is just because they weren't enrolled in clinical trials, they haven't changed fundamentally and biologically, and so if those things were important to them at age 74, we should continue screening at age 76. There's also additional data. The data, although they don't come from randomized trials, come from cohort studies, some prospective, some retrospective that, it looked, that have looked at people who have continued screening, and found that there is evidence that cancers are detected earlier and that lives are saved with screening, and that the risks of cancer screening are generally thought to be fairly low in people who remain in reasonable health. The guidelines from societies that are trying to extrapolate to these older adults in the absence of direct evidence have built models expert panels and other ways of looking at the data and have concluded that it is reasonable to continue cancer screening in individuals who have a re reasonable remaining life expectancy. They're in average or good health so that they are more likely to get benefit than not. So on the con side, there are several important arguments that are made. First of all, we don't have evidence from randomized trials. And the strongest level of evidence comes from randomized trials. In the absence of randomized trials, we are looking at indirect evidence that is always subject to more bias. The studies that look at cancer screening that are not randomized trials in 80-year-olds and 85-year-olds and show that they do better are picking people who continue being screened. People who continue being screened are systematically different from people who are not being screened. And so unless you're randomizing to one versus the other, in any of these cohort studies where you pick up people who continue being screened, you are looking at a healthy survivor bias or a selection bias, that the people who continue being screened tend to be observing other good health behaviors. They're physically active, they're cognitively well, they eat well, they engage in other preventative strategies, so they're not your average older adult. They are the cream of the crop, and anything you do with them, they will look better than average, and that's a selection bias. It's not because you've done the screening, it's simply because they are who they are, and there's an intrinsic selection bias. So that's one counter-argument, that in the absence of high-quality randomized trials, we are treading on very thin ground with a lot of potential bias. The second counter-argument that's made is that these procedures are not without risk. And the risks, although they may seem minor, in, in women, for example, who start breast cancer screening at the age of 50, even by the time they reach 70, where the guidelines say you continue screening until that age, the number of false positive mammograms and the need for biopsies increases substantially. Some estimates of, suggest that up to 60% of women who have regular annual or every other year screening will end up having a positive test and that positive test will be a false positive based on subsequent testing. And that subsequent testing may include biopsies which increase anxiety, have risks of bleeding and infection. People may go on to additional diagnostic testing or even treatment of cancers that would never do harm 
in these women's lifetimes. And so those risks are there in the breast cancer setting. Similarly, with colorectal cancer screening, if one is doing colonoscopy, for example, the risk of perforation goes up every decade once one reaches the age of 60. So at age 70 and 80, the risks are going up, but the benefits are not. If anything, in fact, the benefits are going down because the competing risks of dying from other causes, heart disease and lung disease and other things, are going up as we age, and simply dying from advanced age is going up as well. So the likelihood of, of a man or a woman in their mid-70s getting benefit from cancer screening at that age in five or ten years, because one needs to live that long to see the benefits, is dropping. The risks are going up, the evidence is uncertain. Then one rolls out economic arguments, and because of the increased risk and decreased benefit, the cost per cancer detected, or the cost per cancer-related um, mortality that is avoided, becomes higher and higher. And these things all need to be considered, and these are the major counter-arguments to considering screening. The last counter-argument that's made is that there is already a lot of overscreening. There are multiple studies, for example, looking at men in their 80s or women in their 80s who are getting prostate or breast cancer screening that is continuing in these people who have moderate comorbidity and an 80% or greater likelihood that they will have zero benefit from screening. And yet they continue being screened because the patients want it, the doctors want it, it's easier to continue screening than to stop, and the message out there is that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. And so, of course, we should be screened. And so all of these things lead to people wanting to continue screening, but screening isn't always the best thing to continue. And so it becomes trickier to be able to implement a rational policy to figure out who should be screened and who should not. And these are some of the other counter-arguments that if you start to expand screening even more than what we have now, we will increase the number of people who are getting over-detection, unnecessary complications, and picking up cancers that are unlikely to do them harm in their remaining lifetime. So it's a great question, and right now, the genomic sequencing, for example, is changing the way we can profile individuals and their risk of cancer. We haven't yet seen, to my knowledge, models that have incorporated that in the older adult, but these models are coming. And so if we can identify individuals who are higher than average risk of, de of developing cancer, those models would then suggest that these individuals may be the ones we should target our screening in because we're most likely to get benefit and the risks are not increased compared to people who are genomically not at higher risk. So that would certainly be the case in breast cancer, that would certainly be the case in colorectal cancer, but these models have not yet been built that I've seen in these two particular scenarios in the very elderly. But I'm sure the models are coming and they will refine our ability to predict who is at higher risk of developing cancer and may benefit more, whereas the risks would not be increased. And so that might be a great win-win. So the other issue with new technologies is around digital screening and how more efficient ways of being able to read these mammograms, for example, will allow us to be able to decrease the false positives and false negatives compared to the visual eye of a radiologist. So it may improve the throughput, whereas you could see a thousand films in an hour instead of 100 films or 50 films. I'm not a radiologist. I don't know how quickly they do it. But we know that with um, modern advances in, in artificial intelligence and digitally enhanced screening, we can more rapidly detect, at least in the setting of breast cancer with mammography, the likely areas that need to be biopsied. And so this will decrease the false positive rate and should also decrease the false negative rate. Both of these are potential harms of screening. And if we can reduce those harms, that may shift the attractiveness of screening a little bit in breast cancer. I'm not aware that the same technologies will be as useful in colorectal cancer, although with the newer fecal immunochemical testing that's come out um, and applied in multiple countries, including in my own country of Canada, that is going to decrease the number of false positive screening tests compared to the old um, GUIAC-based stool testing. And so with fewer false positives, again, we are decreasing the burden, reducing the harms, and shifting the ratio towards more favorable screening parameters. Yes, I think that I have seen enough cases where cancer screening is being done in individuals who have multiple comorbidities and competing risks of dying 
and it's been difficult for the clinicians and the patients to be able to say it's time to stop screening. And so I know that that has partly influenced my practice and when I go around and teach and discuss with colleagues that we need to be aware of the best way to discuss these issues and there's not a lot of data on what is the best way, what are patients interested in hearing, how can you have a rational discussion given all the time pressures in clinic, given the strong values that people often hold, and this is an important area where there's a lot of uncertainty and we really need to understand this better because we don't want to come to a patient and just say, you're 77, you're not going to benefit, let's just stop screening. That's very high-handed. It does not um, sit well with patient-informed decision-making and we need to find a better approach. The clinicians want a better approach, the patients want a better approach. So that's one thing I've seen where there's been multiple instances where screening has been conducted and cancers have been detected that probably shouldn't have because no one's going to treat those cancers. Now the patients and families are anxious, the clinicians get distressed, and we haven't really done a service to the patient. Sometimes, in fact, we've done them harm, not only by anxiety, but we've subjected them to unnecessary testing. On the other hand, I've also seen scenarios where people have not been screened um, simply because they're getting into their 70s and it was felt by either the clinician or the patient that this patient's getting older, they don't need to continue being screened, and they end up getting an invasive cancer and needing therapy for it and likely would have benefited from screening if we had taken a more nuanced approach and thought about screening and not just looked at the guidelines say age 75, we stop or we should not continue, et cetera. And so I've seen both ends of the spectrum, which clearly reflects the complexity of, of clinical decision making. The challenge is figuring out how to implement this in practice when clinicians are busy, patients have these values, and, and figuring out a new approach when we don't have the evidence and the best practice to do that yet. And that's an ongoing struggle. I think a multidisciplinary discussion would be helpful. I think particularly, for example, in the primary care setting, we have to figure out ways at a broader level, and this is not my research focus, but we have to figure out ways at a broader level to incorporate all the different elements of preventive care and cancer screening and other things that a clinician and a patient need to discuss that have good evidence behind them, but we need to figure out ways to remunerate the clinicians to do this or find alternate funding models. That may involve a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, a clinical nurse specialist, someone other than the physician who is very well trained and very well paid, but also pulled in many directions and may not need to be there for all those discussions. Could that involve, for example, decision aids? Could that involve educational videos? Could that involve discussions in groups? Could that involve discussions with other allied health professionals? I think all of these are potential avenues where we could go to figure out what would work best. And of course, what works in one healthcare system may not work in another. But I think multidisciplinary approaches, including involvement with geriatricians, for example, in complex borderline cases, I think would be really important. And also, not just at the level of the individual patient-clinician interface, but at the level of educating clinicians more broadly, I think we need to think of ways of designing better educational materials and better resources so that people can efficiently figure out who should be screened and who should not and how do we deliver that information. And to develop those materials, I think we need a truly multidisciplinary approach, including educators, including clinicians, and including patient and family representatives. I think it's a great question. I think one needs to think about a couple of different things. First of all, there's the whole economics angle. And in some countries, if the guidelines say stop screening at a certain age, the governments won't pay for it anymore and people have to pay out of pocket, many insurance companies won't pay, and that becomes a very fiscally challenging thing to think about. And so that's complex and I don't know how best to deal with that, to be honest. Um, it's a very difficult decision and, and, and set of discussions. In countries where there are publicly funded healthcare systems or insurers are willing to provide, I think we need to think about discussions with the providers and the, and the payers to understand how to have a more nuanced um, approach to who should have the procedure paid for and who shouldn't. If we simply follow the existing guidelines that are produced by evidence-based bodies that say the trials went to 75, we stopped screening at 75, nobody's going to fund it, that's probably too blunt an instrument. 
But in order to find a better instrument, we need to have discussions not only with clinicians but with policymakers and with guideline developers to say, okay, how can we extrapolate from the guidelines in a rational way that will allow us to have um, better and clearer guidelines so that payers are willing to adopt those and say, okay, in people who are, for example, age 80 and based on these screening tools have a good remaining life expectancy and based on patient preferences, they're consistent with wanting to continue to be screened, therefore, let's get screening continued. And developing those kinds of guidelines is important to do and can be done, I think, in more than one country. We don't need a U.S. set of guidelines, a Canadian guidelines, an Australian set of guidelines. Some of these can be spearheaded by groups that represent, for example, um, high-income countries with publicly funded healthcare systems that can look at a broader scale and not just country-specific, but more broadly look at the evidence. Because the evidence is not unique to Canada or the United States or, or the United Kingdom. These pieces of evidence can be incorporated into multi-country guidelines, but probably we need separate guidelines in publicly funded healthcare systems in high-income countries and those in more middle-income and low-income countries where the pressures of economics are quite different, but also in many of those countries the life expectancy is also quite different. And so one size does not fit all. I guess the other thing I want to highlight is the emphasis is on breast and colorectal cancer screening. Prostate cancer remains a very vexing and problematic issue and one that's not easy to resolve despite randomized trials because two large randomized trials were done. They had inconsistent evidence and there are pros and cons to each study, but clearly many guideline bodies and others who've tried to interpret the evidence have been conflicted trying to incorporate those. So prostate cancer screening remains vexing even in younger populations, let alone the older adults. So that's problematic. Um, and lung cancer screening is something that we're really not discussing enough, and I think we need to think about it, particularly because there's evidence to suggest that screening in ongoing smokers or people who stop smoking but have a significant pack year exposure should continue. And again, the randomized trials enrolled people up to age 70 or 75, but if you're 76 and you are a current smoker or have at least 15 pack year smoking history and have stopped less than five or 10 years ago, you would otherwise meet the guidelines except that you're above that age cutoff. Should we be screening for lung cancer? That's not being debated today or tomorrow, um, but I think it should also be discussed, especially because the surgical treatments have improved and the non-surgical options for cure with stereotactic um, body radiotherapy, SBRT, um, that has led to an era where we can offer less invasive therapies for cure for lung cancers that are detected. But should we is a more complex question because life expectancy is reducing, competing risks are going up, and we need to think about these factors. So I'd like to see more of a debate and discussion around the lung cancer um, screening approach as well as thinking about more policy papers in that area.